Good morning and welcome to today's talk on famous composers. Today we're going to look at the remarkable career of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Mozart was born in Salzburg on January 27, 1756, the last of seven children. However, when Mozart was born, five of his siblings had already died in infancy or early childhood. His only surviving sibling was his sister, Nanero, who was five years older. Mozart's father, Leopold, was a composer and his grandfather had also been a musician. Times were hard and the family had been struggling for some time. When she was eight, Nanerol began keyboard lessons with her father. Mozart's sister was extremely gifted at the keyboard and she had been making excellent progress when her brother, then aged three, demanded to be taught as well. In just 30 minutes Mozart mastered a piece of music, which his father had copied into Nanerol's notebook. Wolfgang's achievement was followed in rapid succession by others. By the time he was six, the little boy had written a composition of his own into the notebook. And by age seven, he had taught himself how to play the violin without ever having received a lesson. When Leopold Mozart saw how extraordinary his son was, he decided not to waste Wolfgang's precocious talents and took him on a tour across Europe with his sister. At Linz, Wolfgang gave his first public concert. Among the audience were some important statesmen who were astonished and hurried on to Vienna to spread sensational reports of what they had seen. By the time he was 17, Mozart's reputation had already begun to spread through Europe and his family were richer than they had ever been before. Excuse me, I'm conducting a survey on how people spend their free time. Do you mind if I ask a few questions? Okay, I'm just waiting for my friends. They are always late, so I have a few minutes. All right, can I have your name? It's Peter Harley. Do you work or are you a student? Well, both actually. I'm studying really hard for my exams this month. I'm doing math at university, but I also help my parents out. They own a restaurant and I work there as a waiter in the evenings, so I don't get a lot of free time during the week. It sounds as you are very busy. Yes, I am. My mom is always saying, I don't help enough in the restaurant, but I do manage to find some free time most days. Now, can you have a look at this list and tell me whether you do any of these things and if so, how often? Sure, well, I love music and I am learning to play the piano. I get up really early and I practice for an hour daily. I also play the guitar in a band with some other friends. We used to practice together at least three times a week. What about the next thing on the list? I assume you are too busy to play them. I used to play them, but now I'm too busy studying, and I don't miss them at all. And do you use a computer for other things? I use the internet just about every day for my studies, and I also use it to keep in touch with my friends and family. My cousin is living in Thailand, at the moment, and he sends me regular emails to let me know how much fun he is having. Thanks, it was nice talking to you. Well, it's Millie's turn to give her tutorial today, isn't it? That's right. I'm going to talk about renewable energy source, and specifically solar towers. I'm not sure how much you already know about solar towers, so I thought I would start with a few questions. First of all, does anyone know how solar towers work? Don't they somehow use the sun's energy to create electricity? Yes, in a way. They actually work by using the sun to make columns of hot air that rise upwards through the center of the tower. Now, do you know how old this idea is? I would have thought it was 20th century idea. That's when we have had to start thinking about how to solve energy problems, isn't? No, the first time solar energy was produced was in the 17th century. So, it's not a modern idea at all. And Leonardo da Vinci also made sketches of a solar tower. Though he never built one. The recent history starts really was man called Jörg Skolage. Yes I read about him. He is a professor from Germany and he needed a country with a plenty of sunshine and land for his research, so he chose Spain to build the first tower. Correct. Well, everyone seems to know something about these towers. Yes, but still don't really understand how they work. I have made a flow guard to help you. Firstly, you have to realize that they are very tall towers, they have constructed out of high strength concrete and they can be as high as 1000 feet. There is one being built in Australia, that's one kilometer high. Now, all around the base of the tower they have a sunlight collector which is basically a large sheet of plastic. 
it extends out for as much as 7 kilometers, and it is raised off the ground slightly, so, it heats up the air underneath it. So it acts like a greenhouse. That's right. And what happens to- I do apologize for keeping you waiting, would you like a cup of tea or coffee? That's very kind of you, but I'm fine thanks. Now I just want to run through a few questions with you. Firstly, why have you applied for this course? Well, I have been interested in teaching, and I have finished my first degree at Stanford University, so I would like to gain a teaching qualifications. Can you explain your reasons for choosing our college specifically? Well, that's easy. My brother lives in the city, and I'm hoping for a place on this course because then, I will be able to share a flat with him. Oh, I see, so there isn't anything about our course that attracts you. I didn't mean it like that. I was really impressed with the description of the course in the prospectus. I didn't apply to the other university in the city, because their course didn't appeal to me as much as yours. That's interesting, can you say a bit more about what interests you about this course? Well, I like the structure of it. And the fact that all the Falks in the first term is on theory, I like the idea of learning about teaching before being asked to do it. Do you see what I mean? Yes and it sounds like a good reason to apply for our course. Have you talked to anyone who has done this course? Yes, my friend did. She warned me about all of the hard work. But that's okay, I expect to work hard. Excellent, do you have any concerns about the course? Well, I must admit there are some aspects of the course that I'm a bit scared of. What are they? You can see from my application that I'm not very good at math. Will that cause me any problem? That's very honest of you, but there is no need to worry about that. I's not important for this course. That's a relief. But the thing I'm most worried about is the classroom practice. Most people are frightened of being in front of the class for the first time, but they tutors will help you to feel more confident. I haven't had any real experience of teaching, and I'm worried about not being able to control a class, the pupils being rude to me, if they shout at me in class, I'm not sure what I will do. That's a common worry, but you will be taught how to deal with those things by the tutors on the course. Have you written your assignment yet? No, I haven't but I've been trying to get some ideas together. What sorts of things have you been doing? Well, I have worked very hard for the last two weeks, and I have nearly finished all the books on the reading list. I have made quite a lot of notes, but they are not structured. What about you? I did the reading a few weeks ago, and I made notes on the most important things. I have written a rough plan this morning and I was going to make a start on writing the assignment today. But, I have decided that I need to read the most important parts of the books Aji and before I do that. I'm actually finding it quite hard. It's the first time I have ever had to write such a long essay so, I'm a bit nervous about it. Yes, it's the longest essay I have ever had to write as well. I find all the reading is so difficult. I read five books last week. They all said different things. I find the best approach is to read only the sections that you need in order to answer the question. You don't usually have to read the whole book. I have collected plenty of the information for the assignment that way. That's good advice. I have been trying to read the whole of each book. And the more I read the more confused I get. I probably wasted a lot of time last week. I will tell you what other things I found really helpful. When I was in the library last week, I read leaflets called how to get the best out of the library, and how to write assignments. They really helped. Have you read them? No, I haven't even seen them. I will have to get hold of a copy. Hey, sound very useful. I really need some direction. I find I'm really tired at the moment. I have read six articles this week, but I can barely remember what they said. In fact, I have been feeling tired since I started this course. I know what you mean. I felt like that as well. At the start until one of my tutors told me, it was far important to get enough rest than to stay up late studying. I have gone to bed early morning every night. Since then and I managed to concentrate for longer during the day. So in the end I do actually get more done. I went to bed at 10.30 last night and I feel great. I have just woke up and I'm already tired. I must try going to bed early at least till I have done this assignment. Yeah, it should help. When now, tell me was animal care something you always hoped to do? Yes, absolutely. I have always been interested in working with animals during my last year at school, so I decided to do an animal management course. Was it difficult to find the right course? No, not realty. I chose to study at Fairfield College because it's got a good range of animals and everyone is really friendly. Tell us a little about the course. Well, we get a lot of practical experience and there is also a lot of theory, but not so much that is boring. 
I want to learn to manage the animals and the business side of it, the course is only three days a week. So, I have already started working part-time at a pet job. That must be interesting. Yes, it's quite a varied job, my favorite job is feeding animals. Some people rush through this. But I prefer taking time so I can get to know them. In fact, I like having the chance to hold them, I don't even mind cleaning them out. And have you been pleased with the course so far? Oh, yes, it's been everything I expected it to be and more, I have practiced handling animals, and they have let us treat some minor problems, like removing splinters from paws. They make us handle all kinds of animals including spiders and snakes even if we don't want to. At first I didn't want to touch the snakes and I remember feeling really scared, but they let us take it slowly, and taught us exactly how to hold them, as long as you remember to do it the way you have been taught, it will be fine, and I remember feeling really scared but they let us take it slowly, and taught us exactly how to hold them. As long as you remember to do it the way you have been taught, it will be fine. I still don't like holding them but I'm not scared anymore. This course has taught me to respect all animals and overcome my fears. What has been the most useful thing you have learned so far? Learning about the behavior of dogs on the course has helped me understand my own dog better. If I heard him bark, I just told him to be quiet. I stopped to think about why he is doing it. What do you hope to do when you have finished? I would really like to work in either a zoo or safari park, told- Hey Janet, have you finished the report yet? Sarah was asking about it. I'm afraid not, I'm about to go to Rome for conference and I won't be able to finish the report before I go. When do you think it will be ready? The conference only lasts three days so, I'm not in Rome, for long just weekend, then I will be working on the report all next week. Can you do it before we have the departmental meeting, at the end of the month? I will easily have finished it by the next Friday, I have got it in my diary. That's great. I will be seeing Sarah at lunch. I will tell her. Thanks. Are you giving a talk at the conference? Yes, the same one I gave last month on plant diversity and environmental changes. By the end of the year I will have given the same talk at six conferences. Luckily it's a different audience each time, but I will soon be getting polite requests to do something different. The funny thing is I still get nervous every time before I give it. Oh come on, I don't believe that. No it's true, I will be feeling really nervous when I get to Rome. I won't be able to relax until I'm actually giving my talk, don't you get nervous when you give talks at conferences? Not sure. Although I always make sure I prepare well. I always practice in front of a mirror. I look a bit of an idiot, but no one can see so I don't mind. I'm giving a talk in London, next month, and by the time I give the talk I will have practiced it at least 10 times. Practicing like that makes me feel confident you should try it. That's a good idea. But even practice doesn't seem to help me. Well, good luck. I will be thinking of you in Rome. When are you leaving? Well, I was going to leave this morning but they cancelled my flight, so on the evening flight. Simon, do you have time for a little chat? Sure, Dad. I was wondered, if you had thought about what you were going to do with the money your grandfather left to you. Well, I have started to give it some thought. It is quite a lot of money, so I want to make sure I don't just waste it. I have thought about leaving it in the bank for a while. Well, unless you invest it properly, you won't earn much interest and it may lose value over time. Yes, but if I invest it, I won't be able to access the money quickly when I've decided what to do with it. Will I? What sort of thing you would like to do? At first, I thought about taking a trip around the world. But if I went traveling, I would lose a year of study, and I would not have any money left for anything left. Very true. If you were to spend a year traveling around the world, you would probably need an awful lot money than this. So, the other thing I wanted to do, was buying a car. Do you think that's a good idea? It is not just the initial cost of the car you have to consider. But, I'm planning to get a part-time job as well. And it will be great if I could drive to work instead of traveling on the train especially. If I have to work late at night. You know, if you own a car you also have to pay for insurance and road tax, every year, and then there's the petrol. Yes, Dad. I still think, you should do something else with the money. But I'm scared that if I invest it, I might lose it all when the stock market goes down. 
Well, it's best not to look at it like that, you think of it as a long-term investment. Now, I know you want to buy a car, but as long as you get a second-hand one, you should be able to invest some of the money as well, that's what I would do, if I were you. But dad, there is the fantastic brand new car that I have seen. How is your new car going? Don't ask me. It is a nightmare. I should never have bought it. Why? What's wrong with it? I thought you'd got one of those fancy new models. I did, but that's part of the problem. If I had bought a second-hand car I would not have taken out this big bank loan that I have got. So, I suppose you have got big repayments to make. And I cannot sell the car until I have paid for it. But it's not only that. I had no idea running a car was going to be so expensive, I wish I had thought about the other costs before I bought it. It probably wouldn't be so bad if the price of the petrol hadn't almost doubled last month. Don't remind me. The petrol alone is costing me a fortune. Lucky that you have got that part-time job. That's just the thing. Nearly all of my wages are going on the car. If I had waited a bit before buying the car, I would have managed to save quite a bit by now. I might even have gone on that college trip last week. It sounded great. Oh dear. Can't you ask your dad to help you out? No way. When my granddad left me some money, my dad didn't want me to spend it on a car. If only I had listened to him, none of this would have happened. I wish he wasn't always right. Well, you should value his opinions more. You do seem to argue with him a lot. The worst thing is, Dad wanted me to buy some shares with the money and they have gone up by 30%. I should have listened to him if I had taken his advice. I would own a small fortune now instead of a big debt. I wish I could help you. But I have less money than you. At least you have a car. Will you help write this advertisement for the spare room? Yes, we have got so much space. It would be great to get some money to help with the rent. Now, we need to make it sound inviting. Well, the room might be on the small side. But the windows are very big. So the natural light is really nice. Few rooms have such good natural light. Yeah, it's great room for working in. During the day, and it's also got great view of the garden. Exactly. What shall we say about the furniture? Well, it's not luxurious, but it's very comfortable. Both of the lights in the ceiling are really old and not very bright. The room has everything you need except they need to bring their own lamp. Both of the lights in the ceiling are really old and not very bright. That's true. But it has got a nice bed. Yes, and it's got a great wardrobe. Which has even got a few shelves for clothes. Well they will need to bring their own mirror if they want one. Yes, there isn't one in the room at the moment. Now, there is no room for a beside table. But there is a good study desk in there. Yes, I would not mind a desk like that myself, actually. It's better than mine. It's got three drawers, mine has not got any at all. Why don't you put it in your study then? It's too big. There isn't much room in there. I suppose not because the desk has got shelves on top as well. They are really handy for putting books. Now, what else? What about the location? We could say it's close transport. We are lucky because we have the bus and the train nearby. That's true. And what shall we say about the rent? Well, let's say it includes electricity and any other household's bills and make it $60. Our expenses are bound to go up with an extra person in the house. Yes, you are right. I hadn't thought of that. Now, pass me the newspaper. I thought you had already read the news today's. Yes, I have, but there are lots of advertisements for accommodation. And I want to look at them before we finish ours. Excuse me, can you spare a few minutes to answer some questions? No problem, what is it for? I'm doing a survey about people's shopping habits. For a university assignment. Oh. All right. Great. First, I need to ask about your household. Do you live alone? No, I live with my family, my husband and three children. And how many times a week do you do the food shopping? I usually do my food shopping once a week at the supermarket. Do you usually shop alone? Or with someone else in your family? I always do it on my own. If I go with the others, they usually put too many things in the trunk. I have recently moved to the area, and I want to do some activities. We have excellent facilities, 
including a new gymnasium and several tennis courts. Our tennis team is always looking for new people. Oh, I was never good at gymnastics. And I don't think I have got time to put into learning tennis. I'm more interested in swimming, and I would also like to take a few yoga classes if I can. We have three swimming pools, an Olympic-size 50-meter pool and a 25-meter pool, which are both outdoors, and a heated indoor pool, which is just 15 meters long, but it is very popular with the members in the winter. Do members have to pay to use the pool? Members don't pay for the pool. If they just want to swim laps on their own. They even offer complimentary classes for beginners. But they do charge a small fee if you want to take part in advanced sessions. There is also a fee for our water-based Keep Fit class. Would I need to book any of the facilities? Or can I just come whenever I want? They don't allow actually anyone to book the swimming lanes or the gym equipment. But for safety reasons we can only have a maximum of 7 people in the sauna at any one time. Any well, today's topic for debate is homeschooling and the question is. Is it better for us to educate our children at home rather than send them to school? What do you think? Well, I was educated at an ordinary school and I don't have any regrets. Personally, I feel the teachers did a really good job and that I have benefited from the experience. What about you, Scott? Well, I'm a bit like you, Jessica. I went to normal school and, fortunately, I had a great experience there, mind you. I can see that being educated at home would be good for some children. There was a boy in my class who was bullied by some older boys. And I think he must look back at his school days and feel really bad. If he had been educated at home he would probably feel quite differently. But in general I don't think it's a good idea. So, do you know anyone who was homeschooled? Yes, a girl on my course. Was taught at home by her mother. Surely, her mom can't know enough to teach her everything. She must have missed out on a lot of subjects. Actually, she believes that she received a better education. I would be totally bored staying at home all day. Well, according to my friend, they did a lot of fun things, like going out for walks and looking at nature and going to the theater to see literature in action. I can see the benefits of that. Yes, but what about the social aspect? Doesn't your friend feel she missed out on making new friends? No. I don't think so. They have online clubs where homeschooled children meet each other, that's how they made friends. Yes, but it's likely that those people will be very similar. I doubt that they met many people from different backgrounds and cultures. Which in many schools it is possible to do. In my opinion that's a disadvantage. Yes, I think that's a good point. Unfortunately, schools do seem to be more overcrowded and less well funded these days. And I can see that the advantages of home education, in terms of the quality of education L. That's certainly the way my friend felt, mind you, I don't think she finds it hard to interact in large group of people. And interestingly, she doesn't have a great relationship with her parents these days perhaps she had enough of them as a child. Anyway, I'm glad that my parents didn't educate me at home some of my best friends today were friends I met at school. Fish has long been a staple food in many cultures, but there has been some controversy recently about the benefits and risks of fish consumption. For example, we know that fish supplies us with polyunsaturated fatty acids, substances that have been found to protect against heart disease. Moreover, because it is beneficial to the development of the brain, in many cultures fish is known as a brain food. However, Recent studies have shown that fish can also contain mercury, which is poisonous in large doses and has been linked to lower intelligence. As a result, people are unsure whether to increase or decrease the amount of fish they eat. We recently undertook a project to evaluate the health advice currently being given about fish consumption. Although this work was supported by grants from the Fisherix Scholarship Fund, this did not affect the research findings or interpretations of the results. We discovered that, in spite of the literature available on the risks and benefits of fish consumption, there are still important gaps in this information. Despite these gaps, however, decisions about how to advise people on fish consumption should be made based on what we know now. Firstly, in terms of heart disease, 
It has been shown that consuming even small quantities of fish can lower your risk of heart disease by 17%. Secondly, consuming fish is known to have a beneficial effect on brain development. Finally, although exposure to mercury through eating fish can have a negative effect on IQ levels, the effects that have been observed are relatively small. To sum up, it would seem that the health benefits of eating fish Good afternoon, everyone. Today I am going to tell you about the research I have been conducting into the history of soap. While you may be able to find some information on the origins of soap, it is not a substance which has excited a great deal of study so far. What we do know is that even as long ago as 2500 BC soap was being used. Of course, initially it was only ever used on clothing rather than the body itself. In fact, Although soap has existed for so many years, the use of soap for personal hygiene was unheard of until fairly recently and is considered to be a relatively modern notion. So we can only assume that other activities must have provided the basis from which this key concept arose. To make soap you need to combine three materials in relatively exact proportions. So, how is it that these primitive people from over 2000 have discovered soap? Well. What these people lacked in technology they certainly made up for in practical skills. I carried out some experiments using basic techniques to try to find out what people without any chemical knowledge might have observed. And I was able to demonstrate that they would indeed have been able to make a soap-like substance that is not dissimilar to the one we know today. Years ago could. However, it is fair to assume that as the process requires a certain amount of time and specialization, soap would most likely have only been available in the wealthy communities. Although there are claims that the British Celts and their European counterparts used soap, there is no real evidence that the British colonies of the Iron Age had access to such a product. Now, the history of soap is not easy to discover. As soap is an organic substance no traces of it remain in archaeological sites so we have had to rely almost entirely on written texts for our discoveries. Fortunately there are many of these. The first known written mention of soap was on Sumerian clay tablets dating from about 2500 BC. The tablets spoke of the use of soap in the washing of wool. In another incidence, a medical document from about 1500 BC mentions that Egyptians bathed regularly. It also describes how they made soap by combining alkaline salts and oil which they extracted from vegetables. We also know that the Romans used a mixture of earth, soda and wine to clean their clothes and pots. For the Romans bathing was not just a matter of hygiene. It was a form of relaxation, a social activity. The bather moved from room to room, getting progressively hotter until they reached a steamy room where dirt was sweated out and scraped away with a metal blade. The Romans used scented bath oils, but these were used to moisturize the skin rather than to cleanse it and there is no evidence that they used soap in this way. This is not to say that the Romans did not have soap. During the excavation of Pompeii, a city that was buried under the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, an entire soap factory was revealed, showing that they did in fact have access to soap, but that they simply did not use it for personal hygiene. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. As many of you know I often travel for my job as a rug buyer and this evening P've been asked to give a talk about traveling in Europe and Asia. I'll try to pass on some useful advice for those of you who are planning to travel there yourselves. At the end of my talk, I'll be happy to answer questions. My first piece of advice is to work hard on your research before you go if you want to make your trip enjoyable and rewarding. I plan my trips very carefully for at least three months before I leave, reading about the places I am going to visit on the internet and in books. I had a very memorable trip recently, starting out in Morocco. The city of Marrakesh is an absolutely amazing place to visit and well worth adding to your itinerary. Try to stay near the old part of the city. There are so many historical buildings and so much to see. The mosques in particular are very beautiful. After leaving Morocco I took a long tiring boat ride to Turkey. It was well worth the trip, especially if you like local crafts. 
I bought a beautiful Turkish carpet in one of the villages while I was there. The man that sold it to me spoke very good English, and he told me all about the diff styles of carpet. I was fascinated to see the extraordinary range of patterns. I left the small mountain villages of Turkey to travel to the huge, crowded cities of India. India is a fascinating country, and I have always enjoyed my visits there. Everywhere you go the people are very welcoming and friendly towards visitors. They always seem pleased to see you. It's easy to see why India is such a popular destination for travelers. One of the highlights for me on this visit was the Gujarati Textile Museum. It was the first time I had been there. If you are interested in textiles, this museum is really impressive, with lots of information and some absolutely stunning examples of Indian silk embroidery and other fabrics. If you are interested in seeing wildlife I recommend traveling in the more remote areas of the country. I was amazed at the variety of wonderful animals which I saw on my trip and the most incredible colorful birds with vivid blue and green feathers. I also saw several poisonous spiders, although I have to say that I found the The Olympics is probably the most exciting event in the sports calendar. It's one of the few opportunities to see some of the best athletes in the world competing we get to against each other. And amazingly, each year they seem to be getting better and better. So, you might imagine that the Masters Games, which is for athletes aged 30 and it would be less exciting to watch. Well, this may not be true for long, because recent studies have shown that older athletes are getting faster and fitter. Now, it's true they're not as fast as their younger counterparts, and probably younger runners will always be faster than older runners. However, runners aged 50 and over are actually speeding up more rapidly than younger people. The researchers analyzed the finishing times of 415,000 runners in the New York Marathon between 1983 and 1999 and discovered that finishers from the older group showed the greatest increases in speed. Interestingly, women aged 60 to 68 improved the most markedly, running on average 4 minutes faster each year. Men of the same age ran just over 1 minute faster than previously. Over, not only that. A second study proved that older athletes can achieve the same degree of physical improvement as those in their 20s and 30s. In other words, they are just as likely to achieve their peak fitness as younger athletes. 25 years ago few 60-year-old men and even fewer women would have considered it possible to complete a marathon let alone set record running times. The researchers concluded that people grow weaker not simply because of age, but because they don't keep as active as they did when they were younger. It would seem that the longer athletes keep... Good morning everyone. As part of the Conference on Environmental Awareness I'd like to talk to you this morning about an exciting development in monitoring climate change, Europe's technological showpiece, Envisat. Envisat is a fully equipped observation satellite and it is the largest, most technologically advanced, and most powerful one that the European Space Agency, DSA, has ever created. The satellite was launched in 2002 and is on the trail of climate change, delivering up to the minute information about our changing environment. Seeing the Earth from outer space highlights how tiny and fragile this planet of ours is. Envisat helps people to understand that it encourages us to protect our blue planet as our place of birth, and as the ancestral home where our children and grandchildren will live after us. With its 10 instrument systems Envisat is equipped with the best eyes possible and offers everything that scientists could wish for. This unique flying environment station follows in the footsteps of the successful remote sensing satellites ERS-1 and ERS-2, which were both launched in the 1990s. Climate protection is a challenge for our entire society. The ESA contributes to such endeavors and has provided impressive scientific results in the field of atmosphere, ozone, and climate monitoring and more. The total cost of the Envisat program is 2.3 billion euros over 15 years. Included in this sum is the development and construction of the instrument systems as well as the cost of the satellites, the launch and the operational costs. Each European citizen has therefore invested 7 euros in the environment or about the cost of 2 cups of coffee per year. For that. Every citizen will have access to precise information about changes in the environment including global warming, ozone depletion and climate change. 
This information is absolutely essential and long overdue as the basis for political decisions. The gas envelope around the earth is not determined by political boundaries and none of our countries is able to ignore the implications of global warming. Hello everyone and welcome to Greenville Community Center. Today we're going to be talking about what we as a community can do to help each other in severe weather. Our lovely little village is, as you know, quite remote. There may be other similar sized communities only 25 kilometers away but emergency services have to drive 500 kilometers to reach us from the closest large town that can mean a wait of up to 10 hours before help arrives. Having said that, we are very lucky in that we've always had our own fire service and, thanks to the arrival of Dr. Jones earlier this year, we no longer have to drive so far if anyone gets sick. What we don't have, and are unlikely to get in the near future, is a weather station. Now, the National Weather Bureau can provide a lot of helpful information and even warn us about severe storms, but they can only do this if they build up a database of information and to do that they need local help. That means us. What we'd like to do is set up a group of volunteer storm spotters to pass information on to the Weather Bureau. If so, what do these storm spotters have to do? Well, thankfully you don't have to be particularly skilled at anything. Quite simply, immediately after a storm has passed, the first thing you have to do is call the National Weather Station to let them know. After that you have to complete the report card, which is very simple and won't take more than a few minutes to do. The only other thing they ask is that we keep an eye out for any reports in the local newspaper of storms or storm damage. You need to cut these out and send them in as well. Damage that makes news here is unlikely to make it into the national papers so these can be an important source of extra information. Do you have a garden or, if you live in a block of flats, perhaps you have a balcony or veranda? If so, make sure you store away any objects that could become damaging missiles if picked up by strong wind, things like outdoor furniture or even plants, for example. These can be especially dangerous if you live in a flat which is in a large high-rise building. Once you've taken care of the outdoors you have to consider what could go wrong inside. Remember this isn't just a house or a flat. This is your home, the place where you keep your most treasured possessions. What would happen to them in a flood, for instance? If you're leaving for an extended period of time, the best idea is to find some company that can check on your home while you're away. Perhaps you have a family member who lives close by, or you may have a neighbor that you can rely on. Another possible problem is having your home burgled while you are away. Now. There are often very good reasons why one house is burgled and another is not. In the evening, a home that's very dark can really stand out. So why not install lights which have a timer and program them to come on at times when you would normally be home? Also, make sure you find someone who can collect your mail for you. You'll be amazed how quickly a letterbox can become crammed full of uncollected letters and papers, which is a great help to a burglar looking for homes that are empty. So that's all as far as the duties go. Now, what sort of thing do you and CED to report? Well, they don't want to hear about every single storm that we have, only the ones that bring some unusual conditions. For example, we don't need to call them just because there is hail, but we should report any hailstones that are 2 centimeters in diameter or bigger. They also need to know about damage caused by high wind, especially if it uproots large trees. Again. Don't contact them every time you see a tree fallen over. You should use your common sense and restrict it to those big enough to cause a problem, especially on our roads. They'd also like to hear about very heavy rainfall and more especially any localized flash floods. So, what should you do if you care about our community and you want to help? Well, obviously you'll need a bit more information and preparation than I've given you today so we'll be conducting a training session next month. This will only take up a day, so don't worry too much about it. If you do have the time and would like to come along, then you'll need to talk to the police who are coordinating the event. And as our storm season is from November right to the end of January, you'll need to put your name down by the end of October at the very latest. But if you'd like to get in early, Sergeant Phillips is here this afternoon and he's happy to take names now. This really is important for our community, and we're hoping to get a lot of support. Hello everyone and welcome to today's talk about the current trends in health and fitness. 
Nowadays, it seems as though everyone in the wealthiest parts of the world is battling with their weight and as a consequence, more and more people are joining local gyms or buying home exercise machines. In fact, according to the International Health, Racket and Sports Club Association, membership in health clubs in America doubled from a little over 17 million in 1987 to more than 36 million in 2005. While the figures for Europe are harder to come by, evidence over the past decade suggests that health club membership has doubled there as well. What few people nowadays realize is that the average person in the developed world is now burning 800 fewer calories a day than a generation ago. This means that even if people today ate no more than the previous generation, they would still be getting fatter. Unfortunately, instead of eating less than their parents did, as they should, many people consume a lot more. So what exactly has brought about this change in fitness levels? Well, people in developed countries are not only eating more but are also doing less exercise. Increased technology has not helped. The car and other such machines designed to help reduce our workload are as much to blame as deep-fried fast food. On top of this, the changes in how and where we work have reduced the amount of daily calories people actually need. Such factors are taking their toll on our health, with health costs soaring. And this is where exercise machines come in. Walking machines or treadmills and the like may not be the most efficient way of burning off those excess calories and boosting cardiovascular fitness, but they are certainly the most common. According to the Sporting Goods Manufacturing Association International, some 45 million Americans used the treadmill in 2003. That's an amazing number of people and an awful lot of treadmills. Having said that, an exercise machine that did not even exist a decade ago, the elliptical cross trainer, is fast replacing the traditional treadmill. As its name implies, the machine delivers. Both the hands and feet tracing semicircular patterns, the feet on two moving platforms rather than bicycle in elliptical or swinging motion, within pedals, and the not meant to support any weight, which is important as the hands gripping handles that move but are there is no seat. Since the machine was introduced there, the number of people using elliptical machines in America has tripled to more than 11 million of year. We have been doing some tests to find out if these machines are actually any better than the previous machines or if they are just another passing trend. Dr. John Porcari, a professor of exercise, believes that ellipticals are at Leax in sport science, better than the previous exercisers, but no better than treadmills in terms of increasing cardiovascular fitness. In one set of tests, Dr. Porcari measured the oxygen consumption, heart rate and calorific expenditure of 16 volunteers, there was virtually no difference between elliptical machines and treadmills. But elliptical lower impact on the user than running, claim their manufacturers. True, says Dr. Porcari, who measured this ground recaction forces of the test subjects on the various machines. Running on a treadmill results in forces that are roughly two and a half times the subject's body weight. But using an elliptical machine gives forces that are roughly equal to the subject's weight. This is much kinder on the body and makes the impact comparable to that of walking. In that respect, ellipticals are superior. However, those who do not want to shell out for fancy exercise machines will be heartened by the results of a seminal study in 1969 by Lewis Pugh, a British physiologist, which has been confirmed many times since. Drive Pugh found that, when reaching speeds above 14 km per hour or so, running on firm ground uses up substantially more calories, and therefore leads to a greater reduction in weight, than running on a treadmill or using an elliptical machine. Drive Pew attributed the difference to air resistance. Manufacturers of exercise machines point out, correctly, that running on firm ground creates a greater force on the body's joints than using machines, in part to solar the knees and ankles. But, what they don't say is that modern running shoes go a long way to reducing the impact of such forces. So, perhaps the best exercise of all is simply to leave the car at home, and run to the gym, and then ride past it. After that, just keep going and going and experience. Versus. Speed. Jake, 
aged 16, has a terrific relationship with his grandmother Rita, who is 70. They live close by, and they even take a Spanish class together twice a week at a local college. After class they sometimes stop at a cafe for a snack. On one occasion Rita tells Jake, I think it's great how fast you pick up new grammar. It takes me a lot longer. Jake replies, yeah, but you don't seem to make as many silly mistakes on the quizzes as I do. How do you do that? In that moment, Rita and Jake stumbled across an interesting set of differences between older and younger minds. Popular psychology says that as people age their brains slow down. The implication, of course, is that elderly men and women are not as mentally agile as middle-aged adults or even teenagers. However, although certain brain functions such as perception and reaction time do indeed take longer, that slowing down does not necessarily undermine mental sharpness. Indeed, evidence shows that older people are just as mentally fit as younger people, because their brains compensate for some kinds of declines in creative ways that young minds do not exploit. Yeah, I'll know you Lanos are just as people's bodies age at different rates, so do their minds. As adults advance in age, the perception of sights, sounds and smells takes a bit longer, and laying down new information into memory becomes more difficult. The ability to retrieve memories also quickly slides and it is sometimes harder to concentrate and maintain attention. On the other hand, the aging brain can create significant benefits by BAME tapping into its extensive hoard of accumulated knowledge and experience. The biggest trick that older brains employ is to use both hemispheres simultaneously to handle tasks for which younger brains really ought to bow predominantly on one side. Electronic images taken by cognitive scientists at the University of Michigan, for example, have demonstrated that even when doing basic recognition or memorization exercises, seniors exploit the left and right side of the brain more extensively than men and women who are decades younger. Drawing on both sides of the brain gives them a tactical edge, even if the speed of each hemisphere's process is slower. In another experiment, Michael Falkenstein of the University of Dortmund in Germany found that when elders were presented with new computer exercises they paused longer before reacting and took longer to complete the tasks, yet they made 50% fewer errors, probably because of their more deliberate pace. One analogy for these results might be the question of who can type a paragraph better, a 16-year-old who glides along at 60 words per minute but has to double back to correct a number of mistakes or a 70-year-old who strikes keys at only 40 words per minute but spends less time fixing errors. In the end, if better is defined as completing a clean paragraph, both people may end up taking the same amount of time. Computerized tests support the notion that accuracy can offset speed. In one so-called distraction exercise, subjects were told to look at a screen, wait for an arrow that pointed in a certain direction to appear, and then use a mouse to click on the arrow as soon as it appeared on the screen. Just before the correct symbol appeared, however, the computer displayed numerous other arrows aimed in various other directions. Although younger subjects cut through the confusion faster when the correct arrow suddenly popped up, they more frequently clicked on incorrect arrows in their haste. Older test takers are equally capable of other tasks that do not depend on speed, such as language comprehension and processing. In these cases, however, the elders utilize the brain's available resources in a different way. Neurologists at Northwest University came to this conclusion after analyzing 50 people ranging from age 23 to 78. The subjects had to lie down in a magnetic resonance imaging MRI machine and concentrate on two different lists of printed words posted side by side in front of them. By looking at the lists, they were to find pairs of words that were similar in either meaning or spelling. The eldest participants did just as well on the tests as the youngest did, and yet the MRI scans indicated that in the elders' brains, the areas which are responsible for language recognition and interpretation were much less active. The researchers did find that the older people had more activity in brain regions responsible for attentiveness. Darren Gleitman, who headed the study, 
concluded that older brains solved the problems just as effectively but by different means. For more than 100 years, scientists have argued over exactly what a panda is. Now, finally, with the help of DNA testing, the panda has been admitted to the Ursidae bear family, and the spectacled bear of South America has been confirmed as its closest living relative. In 1869, French Jesuit missionary Père David first described the giant panda to Western science. With just a pelt and reported sighting to go on, he classified it as a bear. However, the following year, zoologist Alphonse Milne Edwards dissected the first specimen and concluded that it had more in common with the red panda, a member of the raccoon family. For more than a century, scientists quarreled over whether the giant panda belonged to the bear family, the raccoon family or a separate family of its own. They had good reason to be confused. The giant panda shares many physical characteristics with the red panda. Both have evolved to feed on bamboo, grasping and eating it in the same way, with similar teeth, skulls and four paws. They also both have a distinctive cry which they use to communicate with others in their group. In the mid-1980s there were several studies involving DNA comparisons between the species. The first investigations linked the giant panda with bears, but in 1991 further tests contradicted these findings and placed it in the raccoon family with the red panda. By the year 2000, approximately 12 studies had been completed, and all except two placed the panda in the bear family. The data from these two studies was reanalyzed by other researchers who finally concluded that the giant panda was indeed a bear. Today, there are eight species of bear. Along with dogs, their closest relatives, cats, raccoons, and weasels, they belong to the order Carnivora, a group of meat-cating predators that evolved some 57 million years ago. The ancestors of modern bears split from this group about 34 million years ago, and today the panda is our oldest living bear, followed by the spectacled bear. Both are survivors of an ancient lineage dating back 18 million years. The rest, the brown, black, polar, Asiatic black, sloth and sun bears, are relatively modern, dating back 4 to 5 million years. Researchers have found that the spectacled bear and the panda have several physical features in common. The spectacled bear's muzzle is comparatively short and it has blunt molar teeth and large jaw muscles which are good for grinding fibrous vegetation, vegetation such as bamboo. Indeed, scientists in Venezuela have found that bamboo makes up 70% of the diet of some spectacled bear populations. For most spectacled bears, however, the bromeliate, a tropical plant with fleshy leaves, is their main food source. Most species of bromeliate grow in trees, and spectacled bears therefore have to be adept tree climbers because they spend their lives foraging for these plants, as well as fruits, in the cloud forest of the Andes. The giant panda's diet is famously dull, with bamboo representing 99% of its intake. This is rather strange given that its physiology is typical of a carnivore and it has no special adaptation for digesting cellulose, the main constituent of plant cell walls. A panda manages to digest only about 17% of the bamboo it eats, a deer living on grass achieves 80% efficiency. It typically feeds for 14 hours a day, consuming 20 kilograms or more of bamboo. Unable to store fat effectively, it continues eating in the bitterly cold winter, at a time when many other bear hibernate. With such a specialized diet, the giant panda has evolved a sixth digit, a prehensile elongated wrist bone called the radial sesamoid. They use this false thumb to roll bamboo leaves into fat, cigar-shaped wads which they then sever using their powerful jaws. They feed mainly on the ground, but are capable of climbing trees as well. The spectacled bear is a more frequent climber and will even climb spiky cacti plants to reach fruit at the top. They also construct tree nests to act as a bed as well as a platform to feed from fruit-laden branches. Very occasionally, the giant panda supplements its diet with meat which it scavenges. Spectacled bears eat carrion, too, and some have been known to kill small calves. Spectacled bears are highly adaptable and are found in a wide range of habitats including rainforest, dry forest and coastal scrub desert. In contrast, 
the giant pandas live at an altitude of between 1,200 and 3,500 meters in mountain forests that are characterized by dense rants of bamboo. There have been many theories as to why the panda has such a distinctive coat, but the most convincing argument is that of George Schaller, one of the first Western scientists to study wild pandas. He believes the contrasting coat may help prevent close encounters with other pandas. In pandas, a stare is a threat, Schaller says. The eye patches enlarge the panda's small, dark eyes tenfold, making the stare more powerful. A staring panda will hold its head low, so presenting the eye patches. To show lack of aggressive intent, a panda will avert its head, cover its eye patches out with its paws or hide its face. Interestingly, the spectacled bear is the only other bear with comparably obvious markings around the eye. One chilly autumn morning in 1945, 5,000 shoppers crowded the pavements outside Jimbo's department store in New York City. The day before, Jimbo's had taken out a full-page newspaper advertisement in the New York Times, announcing the sale of the first ballpoint pens the United States. The new writing instrument was heralded as fantastic miraculous, guaranteed to write for two years without refilling within six hours. Jimbo's had sold its entire stock of 10,000 ballpoints at $12.50 each, approximately $130 at today's prices. In fact this new pen was not new after all, and was just the latest development in a long search for the best way to deliver ink to paper. In 1884 Lewis Waterman had patented the fountain pen, giving him the sole rights to manufacture it. This marked a significant leap forward in writing technology but fountain pens soon became notorious for leaking. In 1888, a leather tanner named John Loud devised and patented the first rolling pointed marker pen for marking leather. Loud's design contained a reservoir of ink in a cartridge and a rotating ball point that was constantly bathed on one side with ink. Loud's pen was never manufactured, however, and over the next five decades, 350 additional patents were issued for similar ball-type pens though none advanced beyond the design stage. Each had their own faults, but the major difficulty was the ink. If the ink was thin, the pens leaked, and if it was too thick, they clogged. Depending on the climate or air temperature, sometimes the pens would do both. Almost 50 years later, Ladislas and Giabbiro, two Hungarian brothers, came up with a solution to this problem. In 1935 Ladislas Biro was working as a journalist, editing a small newspaper he found himself becoming more and more frustrated by the amount of time he wasted filling fountain pens with ink and cleaning up ink smudges. What's more, the SN sharp tip of his fountain pen often scratched or tore through the thin newsprint paper. Ladislas and Giag, a chemist, set about making models of new pen designs and creating better inks to use in them. Ladislas had observed that the type of ink used in newspaper printing dried rapidly, leaving the paper dry and smudge free he was determined to construct a pen using the same type of ink. However, the thicker ink would not flow from a regular pen nib so he had to develop a new type of point. Biro came up with the idea of fitting his pen with a tiny ball bearing in its tip. As the pen moved along the paper, the ball bearing rotated and picked up ink from the ink cartridge which it delivered to the paper. The first Biro pen, like the designs that had before it, relied on gravity for the ink to gone flow to the ball bearing at the tip. This meant that the pens only worked when they were held straight up, and even then the ink flow was sometimes too heavy, leaving big smudges of ink on the paper. The Biro brothers had a rethink and eventually devised a new design, which relied on capillary action rather than gravity to feed the ink. This meant that the ink could flow more smoothly to the tip and the pen could be held at an angle rather than straight up. In 1938, as World War II broke out, the Biro brothers fled to Argentina, where they applied for a patent for their pen and established their first factory. The Biro's pen soon came to the attention of American fighter pilots, who needed a new kind of pen to use at high altitudes. Apparently, it was ideal for pilots as it did not leak like the fountain pen and did not have to be refilled frequently. The United States Department of War contacted several American companies, asking them to manufacture a similar writing instrument in the U.S. Thus Fortune smiled on the Biro brothers in May 1945, when the American company Evershop paid them $500,000 for the exclusive manufacturing and marketing rights of the Biro ballpoint for the North American market. Evershop were slow to put their pen into production, however, 
and this delay ultimately cost them their competitive advantage. Meanwhile, in June 1945 an American named Milton Reynolds stumbled upon the Bureau Pen while on vacation in Buenos Aires. Immediately seeing its commercial potential, he bought several pens and returned to Chicago, where he discovered that Loud's original 1,888 patent had long since expired. This meant that the ballpoint was now in the public domain, and he therefore wasted no time making a copy based on the Bureau design. Establishing his pen company with just $26,000, Reynolds quickly set up a factory with 300 workers who began production on the 6th of October 1945, stamping out pens from precious scraps of aluminum that hadn't been used during the war for military equipment or weapons. Just 23 days later, it was Reynolds' ballpoint pen that caused the stampede at Jimble's department store. Following the ballpoint's debut in New York City, Eversharp challenged Reynolds in the law courts, but lost the case because the Bureau brothers had failed to secure a U.S. patent on their invention.